What Western medicine gets wrong a lot is what steps are there to take for hip pain that aren't a total or ignoring it, right? Because there's not a lot in between that within the confines of Western medicine. Looking at an x-ray doesn't tell us any of that, right? It, it needs to be patient-centered, patient-focused, not I look at an x-ray and tell you how big a surgery you need. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Zero Downside Podcast, where we discuss everything that is non-Western medicine approaches, um, but we do do a compare and contrast of Western medicine approaches and how we handle them a little bit differently. I have Dr. Wade McKenna, who's going to be helping answer some questions about hip pain and the uh, treatments that are offered for it and how his approach differs. I also have Mike Mitchell who will be assisting me with these questions. I'll let him introduce himself. Excellent. I am Mike Mitchell and it's wonderful to be here again this week. My scrub top, if I had letters on it, would have far fewer um, uh, title words underneath my name. He is indeed a fellowship trained orthopedic trauma surgeon. Uh, look, Dr. McKenna, we're always happy to have you and happy to be here with you. Today's topic is a big one. You know, it's hip pain and there's a lot of questions around it and it can mean many things. So uh, with that, I'll let you kind of dive in. Yeah. I, I like being defined as not necessarily <clears throat> taking the party line in Western medicine because I think they're wrong a lot, but I don't think I'm non-Western medicine. I think I'm I'm fine with Western medicine if it's all the stuff we agree with, right? So I think there's a there's a lot of Western medicine that is not patient centric, and and I think for the most part, if you're not focused on the patient and what's best for them individually, that you're probably wrong, right? And so I think that the Western medicine approach to we treat this illness or this disease this way, and they have a very cookie cutter approach because that's all that you're really allowed to when if you're part of the organized part of Western medicine, that means for the most part means you work for someone else and they define what you're allowed to talk to people about. So I think when you talk about hip pain, what Western medicine gets wrong a lot is <clears throat> what steps are there to take for hip pain that aren't a total or ignoring it, right? Because there's not a lot in between that yeah. within the confines of Western medicine. Most orthopedic surgeons won't even talk to you about pelvic stabilization. Most orthopedic surgeons won't talk to you about weight loss. Most orthopedic surgeons won't talk to you about stretching, core stability. Oh, the fact that maybe your hip pain isn't even your hip. Because what's going to happen when you go to the doctor with your hip pain is they shoot an x-ray and they're going to look at the x-ray and tell you if you need a new hip or not. You know what the x-ray doesn't have? Symptoms. Is this where I get to use the word arthritis? Because that's our favorite word. Yeah. I, they have arthritis. They, yeah, they have arthritis. <laughs> that's my favorite word. Uh, I, I think that, that it happens all the time if I'm going to look at your hip x-ray and I'm going to make a decision for you. Yeah. You know what I should know is where are you at, first of all? What's your functional level? What are your, what, what, what can you do? How much do you hurt? Are you taking narcotics every day? Can you sleep? Do you have pain at rest? Do you only have pain if you're kicking a soccer ball with your kids for three hours? Do you have pain just going for a walk? Like looking at an x-ray doesn't tell us any of that, mm. right? It, it needs to be patient centered, patient focused, not I look at an x-ray and tell you how big a surgery you need. And, and, and honestly, that's the Western medicine approach to hip pain. I'm going to look at an x-ray. If you're bad enough, you need a new hip. If you're not bad enough, maybe as an intermediate step, we put you on some anti-inflammatories. I'm fine with that. I think there are some great anti-inflammatories on the market that are really safe for daily use as long as you don't have renal failure. Um, I don't think that over-the-counter medications are all that effective uh, in the treatment of hip pain. I think that uh, it would take a handful of Advil um, to replace one meloxicam. I think the metabolic activity of one meloxicam or Mobic in the morning, which, you know, from, from, a, from a prescriptive information standpoint, I think one meloxicam in the morning after breakfast is probably as effective at 24 hours as 16 Advil would have been. You would have had to take 
three to four Advil every six hours. It has about a six hour. That's its duration. So unless you're going to take it every six hours, you're not keeping a good blood level. Meloxicam keeps a good blood level for 24 hours. So I think if you're going to talk about the treatment of hip pain, anti-inflammatories, stretches, are there good, um, here's some Western medicine we'll talk to you about, turmeric, <laughs> um, the, the berberine, right? All the different uh, herbal uh, or, or non-pharmacopoeia um, prescribed in ways to lower your overall inflammatory load. Peptide therapy, BPC, um, Ipamorel and CJC, muscle mass, right? All those things that could treat your hip pain in a non-aggressive way. I think Western medicine will talk to you you know, anti-inflammatory wise, will kill your will kill your stomach and your kidneys for you um, in Western medicine. And I'm a Western medicine doctor, right? It's not like it's yeah. not like I went to a, a a non. It's not like I went to a medical school that didn't teach me how to do surgery, right? Like I'm I'm I, as an orthopedic surgeon, I did mostly allopathic training as a fellow, um, and and but I did go to an osteopathic medical school because the holistic medicine approach and, and wellness made a lot more sense to me than the allopathic approach. And I think it still does. And I think the allopathic medicine, to its great credit, has come a long way with the terms of holistic and integrative and regenerative, all the terms we actually hate, um, to describe now their approach, trying to approach it from a more holistic standpoint. But I don't think they changed the tools they use. Yeah, They still throw the biggest acts at every problem usually or they tell you or, or they help you try to ignore it and not address the overall things that would really limit your outcome with hip pain which would be weight loss inflammatory load mm -hmm. activity level getting rid of the sedentary kinds as they described some of the old articles because i think sedentary lifestyle is easy to fall into when you have hip pain um, and again, I think that most hip pain, and that's the thing about just throwing up an x-ray and telling someone, do you need a total hip or not? If you don't examine that patient, what's causing their pain may not even be their hip, right? I mean, it's, that's really common in our practice. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's at least once a week that we see someone with hip pain that's already had a total and their hip pain didn't change. You know Why? Oh, the total failed? No. The total looks great. The doctors looked at their total and told them it looks fine. They don't understand why their, why their hip still hurts all the time. Oh, it's the bursa. They have greater trochanteric bursitis, and that bursa is the problem. You just stay on anti-inflammatories. I'm going to put you on steroids. We'll inject yeah. it with some more steroids, and we're going to inject that bursa. And their hip still hurts. You know why? Because they have a disc at 4-5. They have some 4-5 radiculitis. They don't have a whole lot of back pain, but, man, my hip is killing me. I, I, you know, I tell people all the time, if you just divide a line right up the middle of your leg, when it comes to hip pain, let's just define hip pain first. I think that'd be a good place to start mm -hmm. if we're gonna do a quick down dirty hip pain episode. If it's inside your groin, it's your, probably your hip. If it's outside the midline of your leg, your hip pain may not be hip pain. Right. It could be muscle tendinous dysfunction, IT band syndrome. It could be a disc in your lumbar spine. It could be pelvic floor stuff. If you're a woman, Lord, it can be all kinds of intra-abdominal, low pelvic, intra-pelvic intra organs that men don't have that can cause a significant amount of hip pain that's exacerbated at certain times hormonally, mm -hmm. at certain times during your cycle, at certain activity levels, so certain, you know, uterine change. Like there's all kinds of things that can manifest as hip pain in a woman. At iliac, the anterior femoral triangle hernia, mm -hmm. right? The sports hernia, right? A, a, an abdominal hernia. Um, low abdominal hernia, indirect and direct hernias is a cause of a lot of hip pain. And, and the orthopedic surgeon, will, there are people out there that have had a total hip that had a big hernia and their hip pain didn't go away until they had their hernia fixed. But they had a hip because they needed a total hip on, the, on, that, on that film. Mm -hmm. Did you really need it? How do you look at a film and tell if someone needs a total hip? Because there are plenty of times the one that looks worse on film isn't even the one that hurts. And that happens all the time. You do it at AP pelvis. One hip looks really bad. That's not the one that hurts. So if I was going to replace your hip based on your film, I wouldn't even got the right one. Right? Like that, that's, that's disturbing thought, right? Yeah. You're going to look at an x-ray and tell a patient what they need. Look, 
the evaluation of a hip for hip pain should be pretty regimented. They bring your leg out straight, roll your foot back and forth. If you just put your heel out and kind of turn your leg back and forth, do you have groin pain? Mm -hmm. If you don't, could be referred pain. Maybe that ain't your hip, right? Mm. Because your hip is in your groin. Yeah. And if you took your foot out and you just kind of roll it back and forth, or you have someone else roll your leg back and forth, and that ain't causing any groin pain, and then you can kind of bring your hip up and down, like while you're in a chair, kind of turn your leg back and forth, bring it up and down. If that didn't cause a lot of groin pain, I don't care how bad my x-ray looked, probably wouldn't have hip replacement. Right. Yeah. So but, if I'm not going to have a hip replacement, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to ask, but if they are experiencing that pain. Okay. So now at least we are in the right ballpark, <laughs> yeah. right? On what are we actually evaluating, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, so if that, that does, does cause some hip pain, pain right. now, now that x-ray is kind of important. And really what may make that decision on what your options are is going to be an MRI. Because, because if you have intraosseous bony edema on both sides of the acetabulum of femur, if you're getting some femoral head deformity and collapse, like you may need a total hip, right? And I think a total hip outcomes are great, right? People do really well with hip arthroplasty if they're done appropriately. I think some of the new anterior techniques have done really good. Like there's great options for a patient. Yeah. I still think it's really hard to recreate, especially if you don't have acetabular failure. If you don't have bony edema in the acetabulum, Bipolar hip arthroplasty, some of the minimally invasive arthroplasties, those patients do really well for a really long period of time without all the limitations of having a total hip. So I think there's other options because a, a, a hip isn't a hip isn't a hip, right? Like, oh, I have a total hip. That doesn't really even tell me kind of which of five different versions of a surgery you've really had, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not like having a total knee. Well, there, there's a lot less different things that are called a total knee. Like, oh, they could have a hemi or just medial or lateral or patellofemoral. There are some things that when someone says, I had a new knee, you, you don't really know what they're talking about just with that statement because doctors will use that statement to define a lot. So when we say, oh, I have a, a, a new hip or a total hip, there are a lot of things that are described that way. For the most part, short of ignoring it, anti-inflammatories or total there's not a lot Western medicine has to offer you that has great long-term results. So what do you recommend for patients that are in that in-between of, I'm wanting to put it off, but I told I need a total knee. I know you said exercises. Yeah, what muscles are most important to be proactive? The, the, the core, the right? Core? So your low abdomen, mm -hmm. um, your glutes, hamstrings, and quads, um, mobilization, stretches, iliopsoas pain, um, posterior hip girdle. There are there are certain um, stretches. There are um, uh, you know if you focus on um, wall squats, you know things that you can. How if I have a bad hip, how do I get strong? Well, you know it's really hard because everything that you do hurts. Yeah. But um, the patients that maintain some their gait, gait training, being able to stretch and walk, you know, heel touch gait, making sure you wear the right shoes, weight loss. Right, yeah. avoiding a sedentary lifestyle, staying in an anti-inflammatory area of your life, like try to eat a low inflammatory diet. Yeah. Maybe don't stay away from a handful of anti-inflammatories that kill in your stomach. Um, be on a prescription anti-inflammatory and some different herbals. Like there's nothing wrong with trying some peptide therapy, some BPC around the joint. Like what's the downside? Now we have to be careful about recognition of peptides now, but again, if you want to, uh, the way the body would try to take care of your inflammatory load, if, if, are there other ways to take my inflammatory load? I can't take any anti-inflammatories because I, I have a gastric bypass. I have, can't take any, I have ulcer disease. I, okay, well, you're just stuck with an inflammatory load? No, right? Like there are, there are non-traditional, non-Western medicine <laughs> approaches to, to taking care of your inflammatory load. And we'll help you with that. The thing we, here's what you're never going to get in our clinic. That, that I think is one of the only interim steps between ignoring it or a total in, in most Western medicine offices. Steroid shot in your joint, right? Yeah. Corticosteroids intraarticular for hip pain can cause a destruction of the articular cartilage in your joint that's been really well documented for a really long period of time. You know the other thing they can cause? Avascular necrosis. And not just in the hip you've injected, in the other hip, right. in your bone in your wrist, 
in your foot, like that avascular necrosis is the bone just dying. Yeah. And if you look up the causes of avascular necrosis, it's, it's going to say idiopathic, meaning we don't know, right? But really, it says, but these are associated risks. Steroids, mm -hmm. number one. Obesity, alcoholism, and another autoimmune diseases, right? Those are the top four causes of avascular necrosis. W one of those is completely controllable. Mm -hmm. Don't put intraarticular steroids <laughs> into the joint, yeah. right? Because guess what? Intraarticular cortical steroids are not published as making much of a difference on the long term. You could do local anesthetic, no steroids, or steroids with local anesthetic, and the outcome at six months is the same. So steroids did it change your disease? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Right? Did it maybe make you worse? For sure. Because steroids, corticosteroids, are catabolic. Catabolism is to tear stuff apart, right? Anabolic would be to build up. Catabolic means you're breaking all the proteins. Like, guess what cartilage is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It, it, responds, it responds to corticosteroids with the destructive unwinding of protein. So that'd be a bad idea if you want to maintain. How do I grow cartilage in the hip? Let's put some steroids in there and make you better. Steroids don't grow cartilage. Right. They destroy cartilage. If you're having a total hip or hip pain because you don't have enough cartilage, why put something in your hip that makes you have less cartilage? I, I hate the whole argument around all of it. Is it okay if you have synovitis of the joint? Would some steroids make you better? For sure. I'm having no problem with that. But we're not treating osteoarthritis, which is def by definition the l less articular cartilage than you had before. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to treat that with someone that's going to give you continued worsening of the health of the articular cartilage in the joint. Right? So the, the most common go-to for Western medicine is a no-go at our clinic. Hip arthroscopy is where the controversy gets entailed because then it dep depends on what your diagnosis is. Is there great literature on acetabular impingement syndrome of cam pincer deformity with long-term follow-up? Well, I'll, I'll tell you right now, there's a big systemic review of over 1,500 hips published. And you know what none of those papers published were? Level one or level two data. So define that, right? Let, let's talk about that for a minute. How significant is not having that type of data for a study like that that should by all it means that when you're the observer looking at a level three or level four data, it means kind of in my experience, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> We're talking about, do you, does, any, does any surgeon want to do something that thinks it's going to hurt people? No. I, I, it's not that their heart's in the wrong place. Right. And you, but you're treating a lot of x-ray changes with some hopefully <laughs> concomitant symptoms in a patient. If someone has a, an acetabular loose body, a Pipkin fracture, um, it, it, it continued effusions from a big labral tear that's actually getting caught and you're a golfer in a rotational sport, is hip arthroscopy indicated to make a difference for those patients? Yes. Because there's a mechanical failure somewhere in there that needs some type of intervention. How many hip pain patients is that patient? Not very many. Not many right. at all. Does hip arthroscopy make a long-term difference in the progression of osteoarthritis? No, right? Maybe not. It certainly there's not randomized prospective data to show that you limit the progression of joint destruction if you're, it, depending on what your diagnosis you're treating, right? right. Are there diagnoses to be treated with hip arthroscopy? Yeah. Would I want to make sure I fit into that category and try a lot of the other stuff first Yes, just like everything else in medicine. The question to be asked when someone tells you you need surgery is what are there other options that I can try before I, because surgery is going to be a last, last result. Right. And really hip arthroscopy is not the last result. It's stage one maybe of your total, right? Mm -hmm. It's stage one maybe, like we have a patient called the clinic. They're on their fourth hip scope. Yes. And never made their hip better. Yeah. I don't even know how you talk someone into doing the third one if you've had two and you're worse. Yeah. Her, all of her imaging showed that she had no labrum remaining. It was gone. So 
Each. But she had four hip scopes. But she they're had wanting three. to do, and they're wanting to schedule for a fourth. They were they told her that she could try a fourth just to see if they could get rid of the catching and popping, or she could just go ahead and go to the total. So in the in the words of the patient, she was eligible for a total. I like that terminology. That yeah. that's very friendly and patient centric. Uh, she was eligible for a total, but it was up to her on the timing. Well, rule number one, it's always up to me on the timing. Fair. Right? Like the, the, if you're a patient and you've been told this is, you have no other option, you have to do this right now. And like, I don't ever sign something or buy something if someone says for today only. Yeah. Mm. If that's really, really true, then I may need to make a decision. But if I'm not ready to make the decision, there's always an, like, this deal's only good. You know what? There's always another deal. Yeah. Right? Like, like th there's, th there's not a lot of things that are an emergent hip. There's no, your emergency hip replacement. You know what? If you have acute avascular necrosis with complete collapse of the femoral head and it happened emergently, especially if you have a fracture and cause, fracture can cause AVN. You have a fracture of your hip. You have a, a, a cartilaginous fracture called a pipkin fracture of the femoral head. Mm -hmm. You have something like that. Yeah, I think that's really urgent. You probably need to be on a walker, crutches, not put a lot of weight on it until that's addressed. Probably scanned with not only an MRI, but probably a CT to look at the cartilage volume. And because of the fracture pattern, maybe CT can be more definitive from a, from a bone perspective. MRI is more from cartilage, soft tissue, inflammatory load. So you may end up with more than one study before we decide what you need done. Mm -hmm. Do I think that's very many people out there no. that are chronically experiencing hip pain? No. So, so number one, with what you said, it's always that patient's decision. Like yeah. they told me I'm eligible for it. Well, you're always eligible for it. Like unless you have an infected other prosthesis of your total hip, right? Like, I mean, there's, a, there's some things that can make you not a very good candidate for it. Yeah. You're always eligible for it, yeah. right? The, the problem is not being eligible for it. Is, is it going to help you? And is it the last thing left? Is it, I feel, I, I, most again, I think I think probably fifty percent of the people that that have hip pain, it's not even coming from their hip. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. episodes like this are very beneficial. It's also very difficult because the swath of hip pain. Right? Yeah, is it's it really it's really hard to talk. In a, it's very very hard to give good specific information about a general problem. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. because we don't even know. Like when someone says hip. How, how often are they talking about the ball of their hip and their groin? Because yes. most people don't even know where your hip is. They think, oh, this is my hip out here. No, that's a part of your femur. That's where your glute attaches. It, we would consider it part of the hip structure. Your ball of your hip, if people, when most people think when they say their hip hurts, they're talking about the ball of their hip. They've seen those, the ball that, that's groin. That's in the middle of your groin. Right. Yeah. Mm. Let's talk about that patient. Let's talk about the patient where it's middle of the groin. That's the indication. Keeping them right? up at night. Yes. That, hurting all the time. Know, constant mm. ache. Can't find that comfortable position. Every once in a while, a straight leg feels like a good stretch, but then it goes right Been back hurt to for that years. dull ache. Yes. So that's your symptomatic patient, right? Everything else is presented. It it's clearly has to do with non-referred pain. It's the hip. So what are some interventional treatments that you would consider for that patient? So- they, we have a lot of experience with radiofrequency ablation around the knee. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a good technique published for the hip and for the shoulder. Am I a big fan of either one of those, having done them? Not really, right? Um, I, I think that while the technique and procedure exist, I, I haven't been that impressed with the outcomes. It, it, and, and giving it a try, including on my own sister, um, who, who had an ablation, um, didn't seem to make a big difference. Right. We've done it in our clinic um, on on some patients that are near and dear to us. It, it didn't make her worse. It may be, maybe muted some of it. Do I think it was uh, overall useful in in keeping her active and back at doing activity? I don't know. I, I don't think it, it didn't hurt her, and it certainly made a little bit of a difference for a little while. I don't think it's as prolific as it is around the knee. Yeah. And I feel the same way about the shoulder technique. Um, there are some, there's, there's, again, there's no great paper, paper published on it yet. There's not a randomized prospective. We just did ablation on these patients and do anything else. Now, where we cheated on the ablations originally is we were only ablating someone while they were asleep getting cells injected in their hip. Mm -hmm. Those patients do really well. So in our practice, one of the interim steps would be, okay, we're not going to inject steroids in your hip. 
I'm probably not going to scope you for osteoarthritis. Yeah. So what, what can I do that's not ignoring it or getting a total? Biologics, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we treat the hip and, and our, our view of hip pain is a little different because we're talking about capsulitis, adhesions, inflammatory load, and effusion a little bit. And I think of the hip a lot like the shoulder in that the adhesive capsulitis of a shoulder, frozen shoulder, is really well described. There's not a, there's not a description of that for the hip. Does it mean it's any different from a capsular inflammatory load perspective? No, right? It's not much different. And so if you have a capsular inflammatory load that's causing pain and you have restriction of motion, do I think there's some value before I would let someone put me through a total hip that changes my life forever, not necessarily in the best directions as far as what are my limitations? What are my limitations in motion? What's the risk of this coming out of joint? What's the risk of it subsiding? What's the risk of bony failure? All those What's the risk of a blood clot, pneumonia, heart attack, mm -hmm. all those risks, right? Significant surgery. One of the bigger surgeries you can have that's not an organ transplant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think everyone, and that's not controversial, mm -hmm. right? right? We're not going to get, this episode is not going to be unposted because of that statement. <laughs> yeah, no. That's fair. Right? No. Um, talk to me about the importance of volume, right? The, the volume that you're utilizing when you've got a needle. Well, that's that changed hip. a lot for us. Right. And that, because, that's what because Because my about. original thought with hip... Uh, um, arthritis or, or a painful hip joint that was actually the joint was we just need to get the best quality, most concentrated stem cell volume with, with, from your bone marrow, bone marrow aspirate concentrate, uh, or even PRP, biologics, right? And biologics in general, mm -hmm. because we were using PRP for a long time before we were using a lot of bone marrow. So bone marrow aspirate concentrate is the stem cell volume from your blood. Autologous stem cells have been shown to make a dramatic difference in overall cartilage healing and reformation and lower your inflammatory load. Okay. That's not, not the first time you've said that. That is not <laughs> controversial to say. And we're allowed to say it that way. And we have to be careful about just the, in general use of the term stem cell. Absolutely. But with bone marrow aspirate concentrate, there's great thought process now. Now, did I used to just get the most concentrated cell volume and try to squeeze a little bit in that hip? Yes. Do I think that that made a difference for some people? Of course it did. Or we wouldn't still be doing it. Now, have, has my thought progressed in the last 15 years of doing those injections with bone marrow aspirate concentrate? Yes. Why? Because now I have a much more physiologic understanding because of our thought process on a lot of the things that cells or biologics or biologic volume is going to make a difference for people in is because it's lowering the complications of the long-term inflammatory disease. The complications of long-term inflammatory disease are scarring, Okay, can you get that around hip? Yeah, it causes your hip to be tight, it causes it to hurt to stretch out, it causes it to limit your motion. Oh, those are all my symptoms. Okay, well, guess what? If I put, if I think of the the hip joint just like the shoulder is an old collapsed balloon, so the capsule around your hip is really really tight. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, when you go to do an arthrogram in the hip, we do them under anesthesia with C arm and a little dye to confirm placement of the needle in the hip. If you don't confirm that, may or may not be in the joint, right? And you know why I know now, you know what data I gained from that experience of been doing that over the last 15 years is when you go to put a little dye in the hip, it's extremely difficult. And sometimes it's just this little bitty tight rim that you see around the hip and all the way down the capsule. You know what that tells you? There's not a lot of space there. And when you say extremely difficult, you're talking about, I'm talking about resistance. I'm talking about, plunger. I, if I have a 10 CC syringe, mm -hmm. And a 22 gauge needle. Mm -hmm. I can't get a lot of pressure on the tip of that needle, with a, especially with the 10 cc syringe. Now, if you're taking a 10 cc syringe with a 22 gauge needle and that space is real scarred in, I, there are times you almost have to use two hands to get any of the fluid to come out. If I take a 5 cc syringe and an 18 gauge needle, I could hit that far wall with it because I can generate enough pressure to do that. If I take a 20 cc syringe of 22, even with no resistance, I can't really generate enough power through the physics of that needle because the needle is about three, five inches long to get in the hip joint. So now what we will do is I want to develop some pressure when I inject a hip. We don't use 10 cc syringes. We use an 18 gauge needle, mm -hmm. which is why you need to be asleep. Uh, it's you know, three to five inches long, depending on the patient. And we're using C-arm, 
and we're going in from a lateral approach, and I'm going to put it underneath the capsular rim, and I'm putting a little bit of dye. That little bitty rim of dye, what I want now, once I've confirmed placement, now what do I want to do? Now I want as much volume as I can put in there under some pressure, multiple 3cc syringes through that. And I want to get enough pressure in that hip to kind of break all that loose. If you have a balloon that's all scarred in mm -hmm. and I can break some of that loose, it won't tear the balloon up. You can blow it. So instead of pull a balloon apart, you blow in it, right? Now, why do I know that's a good idea? Because guess how many hip fractures we've done where you have to take the whole, the, they break the femoral neck, you have to get the ball of the hip out to put a new stem in. Mm -hmm. Well, there are times where the ball of that hip is so, and the patient breaks it. So sometimes, and I think the really good thought process on femoral neck fractures is that the hip has been so inflamed as it wears out for so long that the capsule is so adherent that as you get a little osteoporotic, you go to twist or turn, that hip doesn't rotate normally. And so that hip is so stuck that when you go to rotate, now you have torsional stress and you've generated a fracture. When you go in to replace the hip because of the fracture, you cut through that capsule. There are times where, and you take a corkscrew, you literally take like a big cork and you, you drill it down into that head so that you can pop the head of that hip out. There are instruments in surgery that are like a big spoon because there are times that that ball of that hip is so adherent in the cup that you have to put something in there to break all that scar. You have to literally cut scar out of it to be able to pop that ball out. Do I think that those adhesions and scar contributed to the failure of that hip? Yeah. So if I've had to do that when you break it, how could I have prevented it from being a problem causing some of your pain as you wear it out and it gets inflamed? I would want to stick something in that can't hurt the cartilage, steroids and local hurt cartilage. I would stick something in that could maybe in a big enough volume to break all that loose. In the beginning, I put two or three cc's of the most concentrated solution. Now our goal is 10 cc's of volume. Concentrated bone marrow aspirate, platelet-rich plasma, PPP added to it, other tissue grafts. There, our goal is about a volume displacement, kind of break those adhesions loose. And then what do we do? While you're asleep, I'm gonna move your hip around. Yeah. So manipulation and anesthesia, Internal external rotation of the hip, bring their hip up to 90 degrees flexion, turn it in and out. While we're looking at it with C-arm with a little dye, because we'll add dye to my cell, concentrate, or the biologic, because then you can see, you can watch it break loose. Yeah. Right? We put a little dye into confirmed placement. Now we add a little bit of our dye to our solution, so you can watch it fill that joint up and break some of that loose. Is there a difference in the arthrogram before and after I move that joint around? A lot. We didn't even make this up as we go, right? And so our follow-up on those patients, now do I feel a lot more comfortable treating a hip that I think needs replaced and worn out if the patient's not ready for a hip replacement? Absolutely. A biologics intervention before a surgical intervention. Because sounds what has, <laughs> what have, it sounds a lot less complicated, right? Yeah. So when a patient asks you, what, because you're the one that gets those questions that, well, what can I do afterwards? What are you telling them? Whatever you could Whatever. do before. Yeah. yeah. There, right? There's no well, how long, is, how long do I need to not go to the gym? Are you going to the gym now? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Don't two days anything. after, next day after, when you're not real swollen and sore, you can go. Mm -hmm. Well, do I need to be on crutches or a walker? No. Nope. Mm -mm. Right? Well, can't, well, do I need to not walk? No. Mm -hmm. Like weight bearing doesn't keep the cells from working. Matter of fact, what we want you to do is as tolerated by pain and swelling, mm -hmm. progress your activity level as quick mm -hmm. as you can. Move, and that's when you'll have other interventional steps, whether it's meloxicam or peptide therapies that have been suggested and recommended. And, you know, we always smirk at that stretches, one. Stretches, core stability, yes. mm -hmm. so pelvic where... exercises, wall squats. What all? Can, what I? What can I do to get your muscle mass as stable as possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that help your hip pain? Yeah. Yeah. So we right. broke your hip free. Now let's broke is a bit of a, a tough term. And we didn't but break. We, we don't we break have, your hip. We have no, we mobilized don't. your hip. I'm going to help yes. mobilize your tissue in a way that's not going to be cartilaginously destructive mm -hmm. and increase your inflammatory mm -hmm. load. If I try to do with you awake, it's two steps forward, two steps back, because if the more you fight, the more I'm resisting the more inflammatory load I generate when you tear all that capsule loose. If I bathe that capsule from the inside and break that loose, yeah. and then I help mobilize that in that fluid bath that I just put there, mm -hmm. 
is that really painful and going to generate a big secondary inflammatory response? No. Does it sound like a really good idea? Yeah, it makes so much sense pathophysiology-wise mm -hmm. that it's kind of silly that we don't describe it that way. Yeah. Because that has changed in our practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm very resistant to talk about hip pain usually because it's so patient-specific. Yes. And right? It's, again, as we discussed, it's a broad swath. So us doing an episode like this, it's, okay, give me details, Mike. Like, tell me exactly what type of patient are we looking at yeah. here? Mm -hmm. One more patient I want to talk about, right? We've talked about obesity as being a, a heavy burden on the hip, right? Absolutely. We've talked about that. Let's, let's kind of... Because there are patient. ways... To, okay, just one quick sentence. Sure. Western medicine is wrong when they say it's only about calories in, calories out. Insulin resistance absolutely plays a role. If you're fighting your physiologic desire, your mm -hmm. body telling you, eat that carb, it's because it's trying to not starve. Everyone that's dieted or had a really long journey against body fat knows that there are times where you could go an entire day not eat anything, and the next morning you gain two pounds. Like, what? I did... Like I walked, I worked out, I did all that. Your body is going into storage mode. It won't even burn some of that, right? You're going to hit your glycogen stores, your muscle mass. Because if you don't have enough protein, if you're not, the first thing your body's going to try to do with calories, with activity is still it from what you've eaten. And then when there's nothing there, it's going to go to muscle mass. It's not going to burn stored fat. It's really hard to get your body to burn stir fat, especially if you're insulin resistant and your body's secreting all this insulin telling you eat a carb, right? Because your body's going to win. That sense in the back of eat the carb. Like, you know the why they're getting ready with some of those peptides to get the approval to treat alcoholism? Because guess what happened in the long-term weight loss study on those peptides we're talking about? A third of the patients that were rated as moderate heavy drinkers just kind of stopped drinking or drunk a lot less on their own because their body wasn't telling you, eat the carb. It's not trying to cheat. Alcohol, for some people, is just a quick, easy, empty carb. That's also why it's bad and why it's hard to lose a lot of weight if you're drinking a lot of alcohol, right? One of the, you know, when someone says, I really want to lose weight, well, if you're having a lot of cocktails or a six-pack of beer three times a day, you're not going to be able to lose much weight, right? It's certainly not healthy. Yeah. So alcohol is an empty carb. No good part of it. Maybe some good part, but not from a weight loss standpoint, right? So, but your body's going to, when you fix that and your body's not telling you to eat the empty carb, do you not need the quick, easy hit? Yeah. So people just kind of stop drinking. They don't enjoy that carb hit as much. Your body's not going to burn it anyway. It's going to store it. It's going to store it as fat because it wants to not starve. It will treat carb intake like green wood. Yeah. You won't even get all the ATP generation out of it. You know, you should get five, six ATP out of a Krebs cycle, you're gonna get maybe two, because you're just, your body's gonna try to not even generate the energy load that you would normally be able to expect if you're insulin resistant. So body, like, it being heavy may not, it, like, it's not your fault. Like, it's not like, oh, we're gonna fat shame people. Okay, first of all, I've introduced myself as the old fat guy for 20 years, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's shaming to say that I wasn't the best shape in my life. But you know what? If you're hormonally broken, there's another thing with hip pain. You know what can be really anti-inflammatory? Hormone therapy, mm -hmm. right? If, you, if your testosterone as a woman is, is 20, are you in an inflammatory mess? Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. If I get, if, if we treat you, are you, do you have less pain? Do you recover faster from a workout? Can you get you some muscle mass back? How are you going to get muscle mass back if you're hormonally in, it broke into the point where you're not going to be able to generate muscle mass and strength right. or tolerate a workout? Really hard, right? Yeah, you're not going to respond to rehab At least, therapies. you know, most of what we talk about with hip pain is the same way we talk about everything else. It, let's tilt the scale in your favor as much as possible. Yeah, mm. right? agreed. Is it about anti-inflammatories? Is it about stretches? Is it about pelvic girdle stabilization? Is it about making sure the diagnosis is even right? Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Does it have to be all that complicated to just look at a film and say you need a new hip? I just don't think that's the place to start, right? And first of all, I can't tell anything from looking at that. I, you know what I can't tell when I look at an x-ray? You're just keeping you awake at night. How far can you walk? Mm -hmm. 
Like, I can't tell any of that. What's your range of motion? Yeah. I don't know what your range of motion is. I don't know if you have log roll being positive. I don't know if you have radiculopathy. I don't know if you have numbness tingling down your foot. I don't know if you have drop foot, weakness in your calf. I don't know any of that from looking at an x-ray and telling you you need a total hip. And guess what? If I don't, neither does anyone else because I'm really smart. Not really smart, but I'm for, for what I do, I'm pretty smart, right? Like, I mean, I'm, I'll put it this way. I'm really well read and I've been around a long time. So if you're just going to compare other people, not my age and their amount of experience they've had, probably not the same as mine. I've been really busy as an orthopedic surgeon for a really long time. So I feel pretty confident in saying if I can't tell from reading that film, no one else can tell from reading that film either, <laughs> right? Yep. Like. Have I looked That's at films and just thing. thought, oh, my God, you need a new hip? Yeah, I have. And you know what? One of my patients that I love talking about is a, a bicycle guy in Iowa that rides like 100 miles a day. I told him 10 years ago he needs a new hip. It's a waste of time to do biologics. He said, I don't care what you I, – I still want you to do it. I want bone marrow on my hip. I did it in my shoulders, and it felt great. I want you to do my hip. And I was like, you're just not much of a candidate. It's really – bone marrow kit used to be like 10 grand. Right. And I was just like, ah, I, I just don't think I think it's a waste of your money. He goes, yeah, but it's my money. And you know what I have? Money. You know what I don't have? Freedom to get on my bike. If I have a total hip, they told me I'm not going to be able to do a lot of what I do. Well, that's true. Then I don't want a total hip. I'm like, OK, well, we can try. Guess what? Ten years later, guess what? The guy still doesn't have a total hip. Guess what? he said? You know how he talked me into doing it? He had his wife take a video of him riding his bike and sent me copies of his watch showing how far he had been and what his daily cycle was. And I thought, whole, here's the one thing I know. Have I looked at your films and your MRI? Yeah. Do I think you need a total hip? Absolutely. Do I feel that same way when I look at your thing and know that you rode 100 miles on the bike today and your wife is showing you get up and down off the bike? No. I don't think the x-rays were a very adequate representation of your functional level. And he had to send me a video to tell, to tell me that because he couldn't, because he didn't know how to say the words of, I'm incredibly active. It doesn't keep me awake. It aches and hurts all the time, but I ride a hundred miles a day on a bicycle. Looking at his film, I thought the chances of that level of activity was zero. I was wrong yeah. because the film told a different story than the patient. I, do I think that that patient needs a total hip based on his radiographic information? Yes. Would a total hip have kept him as active as he is already with the same amount of risk factors as the injection did? Most likely. Absolutely not, yeah. right? Well, that, that's the perfect segue, right? The last sector of the population that we get a lot of questions from, we, we've talked about obese patients. We've talked about patients with, you know, just poor genetics, poor physiology, other, there's so many different qualifiers. One sector of the population where we've actually had a massive influx of inquiries is the athletes, right? Your athlete, yeah. right? He's, he's an older athlete. He's still an athlete. He competes like an athlete. There's no way I'm getting on a bike and going hundred miles an hour unless I'm being chased by a semi, right? Yeah. That's for all hundred miles. Like yes. most of the time, a car going to run out of gas before you have to stop pedaling the bicycle if you're that guy (laughs) yeah like i I fight for a reason so i don't have to run jog or ride a bicycle you hope they're in a you hope they're an electric car because they won't have the range to 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 keep up with you forever (laughs) that's a personal (laughs) my drive's an electric car that's that's hurtful all right so (laughs) moving to our last segment of the population the athletes right how does hip pain present differently the most famous hip injury of all time was bo jackson right everybody remembers that was awful guess what it's because it was treated inappropriately at the time of surgery. Oh, that's the controversy. He had a posterior acetabular wall fracture. And they didn't fixate the pelvis fracture appropriately. And his hip died. He developed avascular necrosis. Had enough torsion Would on Would any it. of that have had to happen if the posterior wall fracture had been recognized and treated appropriately by a pelvis and acetabulum trauma surgeon. We'll never know. Because it wasn't. Yeah. Right? So, diagnosis, 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 right? Now, most athletes don't come in with severe hip arthritis. Right. They come in with some soft tissue injury, some metabolic overload of their inflammatory load, soft tissue injury labrum stuff. Now, if are there a lot of 
conservative stretches, range of motion, anti-inflammatories, I would have to take up as an athlete before I'd let someone stick a scope in my hip and take a lot of labrum out or shave off part of the cartilage in my joint. Yeah, because if you were an athlete for the five years before and you've only had hip pain for the last couple months, it's not reinventing the wheel to say it's probably not the shape of your hip. The shape of your hip is the same as it was five years ago and you were doing great. What's changed? Let's find that out. Right. So let's address the injury. Let's address the soft tissue mechanics. Let's address your your metabolic overload. There are a lot of things to do. Say, oh, well, see how your hip is shaped. We need to shave that off. Well, has it only been shaped like that for the last three months? Because five months ago, it didn't hurt. Five years ago, it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt while I was in height. My hip has been shaped the same way the whole time. Yeah, sure has. I mean, God, this does not seem like advanced level thought. Like I'm capable of advanced level thought, right? Anyone that's known me for very long has had some discussion with me at some point where you may not have understood what I was talking about because I will go off on, like I'm going to fill you up with as much knowledge as I can like a fire, drinking from a fire hose. And, 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 if, and I may exhaust your expertise or my expertise, certainly, because I know a lot about this much of the world and I know nothing about the rest, right? But I'm going to try to educate you up. Stoic, philosophy, theory, like I'm going to win that. But do any, does any of this feel like that it's talking over someone's head? Hey, is your hip shaped any different ones before? No. Okay, maybe that's not, maybe your pains that come from shape your hip. Hey, I don't have all the range of motion I used to. Hey, is there a way to get my range of motion back without a total hip? Maybe. Maybe we need to break it loose. Maybe we need to do some exercise. Maybe. Okay. Like, do, do I hurt less if I'm not metabolically broken? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I hurt less if I'm not heavy? Yeah. Do I hurt less if I'm on a little anti-inflammatory and doing a good walking exercise and stretching out? Yeah. Like, none of this is, like, it doesn't feel like that I'm talking above anyone's head no. with any of that. Why does Western medicine as a whole kind of ignore that kind of what would seem like a very natural thought process? I don't know. Well, guys, I think. So much for your short hip episode. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. wasn't oh. as short, but still nonetheless, very valuable information that I think people searching for just an understanding of their hip pain, their hip diagnosis and um, everything that there is. Okay, I'm just gonna cut off? this off. Will you just shut, yeah, shut it? It means the battery's going yeah. down, yeah. Just, yeah, just or it plug off. it in. So you see that? Nope, okay, yeah, I'll do it, I got it. Okay. Uh, you see that little, yes, and there's a little hole for it? Yes, ma'am, you genius, yes. Awesome. Wait, why is it still? Is, it, is the other end of the cord plugged in? Let's just turn that one off. Ah, oh, nice. And restart, restart your sentence. And yeah, restart your sentence. Before, before it was flashbulb. Right? Yes. Um, so, yes, it was not my 30-minute quick episode, but I am very happy that you got everything out because I think there are people out there who are searching for understanding more of their hip pain and diagnosis. And you gave them all the tools and resources to be asking the right questions, taking conservative approaches before surgical intervention and the possible biologics intervention that they can come see you for. And I think all of it was valuable information. And I hope you guys learned a lot. And I'm going to let everyone else do their usual sign off, but I'll see you next time. Michael. As always, thank you so much. And Dr. McKenna, I, I really appreciate you diving into this i know we kind of throw random hypothetical case studies and things at you in rapid yeah. fashion trying to get the most for patients that are listening the the key thing is this the takeaways are there are a myriad of tools at the disposal of a practitioner of medicine and the choice of which tools to use is completely up to the practitioner for that for that patient in that specific moment. The key thing that you've driven home today is there's more tools available than what a lot of practitioners are willing to use or know about. You've spent a lifetime kind of gathering the cool toys, as we always You say. know why, though? Because a lot of those traditional toys don't work. Why continue to do something that doesn't work, right? Yeah. And, and you don't know that in the beginning. But at 26 years of private practice, you know what I should know? What do I do to work and what do I do that doesn't?
yeah. right? And who does it work on and who does it not work on? Like every problem is not a nail just because I have a hammer, yeah. right? Like, yeah. That well, was good. Yeah. We, you've shown us more of the tool belt to, to put it in, in, in just concise Which was patient driven. Yes, it is. When and you do stuff for patients that do... didn't work and they come back to you and go, now what? You better start thinking out, figuring out what's the now what, right? Like, okay, well, what about this? Okay, Dr. McKin, I, can I try this? Like, I didn't tell that guy with the hip to let me put cells in it. I tried to talk him out of it mm -hmm. for two years. He was right. I was wrong. Now I can take that knowledge and apply it to other people for their benefit too, right? Yeah, I really appreciate it. The insight is is always welcome, and we're thankful to to have you and, and be able to host with you. Um, that's it for me as far as the episode. I really appreciate your time. Look, this was this was our attempt at just doing a quick down and dirty episode to kind of educate some people on hip pain. I know it didn't turn into that, but here's the good news that I didn't think was going to happen. Um, we we were talking about a subject I'm not a big fan of because my thought process on it has evolved so much and it's not well published that that's the way the hip works. It certainly, it certainly is borne out by anatomy and physiology, but I think that for the most part, um, I wanna thank you for your attention. Thank you for tolerating my, my random journeys down the rabbit hole. And, and we genuinely appreciate your trust and, and appreciate your tuning in to, for the information that we hope we're able to give you. And again, in all the humbleness I, that I have in my heart, thank you so much for your trust as taking care of you.